Well, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining the Chamber of Commerce Tuesday talk today. And uh, we may have others jump in here and I will admit them as we go. Just a few housekeeping items real quick. Um, today's uh, discussion is titled Tuesday Talks and we run this series each year um, intended to be uh, sort of educational topics that are pertinent to uh, business and obviously hoping to you know relay information that's helpful as you look at your operations and uh, keep going. So we uh, are recording today's uh, presentation and uh, we'll share that uh, after everything concludes. And um, certainly if you're not familiar with Zoom, you are able in the upper right hand corner to change your view if you prefer the gallery view with everyone here, or when the presentations are occurring, you can switch it to speaker view and just see the speaker, and um, it will auto adjust when we have a presentation as well. I see everyone has their mics muted, so appreciate that, and please um, you know, remain muted until we get to the question and answer portion. If uh, you would like, as the presentation is going, to send chat uh, questions in the chat function, uh, that's a great idea. And we will go based off that and then open it up into uh, an open forum if there's further questions. And um, with that, we'll get right into the program. I want to briefly recognize our sponsors of the Tuesday Talks, the Post Journal and Observer. So thank, that, uh, thank you to them for their support. Let me add one more here. And um, uh, <clears throat> we have on with us today, um, Santo D'Amico from Ultimate Tech Solutions, who are going to uh, show a presentation and answer questions about cybersecurity as it relates to business. And we also have Officer Matt Reinhart from the Jamestown Police Department, who uh, we have been partnering with recently um, with some concerns and uh, helping relay information uh, two businesses about security um, and some initiatives that they have going on there. So with that, um, I will kick it over to Santo, if that's good with you. Hello. Awesome. All right. Um, oh, uh, Dan, am I able to do screen sharing? Let me add you here. Okay. Okay, should be good. All right, I'm going to kind of talk a little bit about something first, and then we have a presentation that's recorded to play. Um, this wasn't included in the presentation because it was just discovered on Thursday, but I wanted to get out ahead of this. There is a, a very big exploit right now called a remote code execution exploit um, called Log4j. If your company uses... Um, this plugin for Java, essentially it goes through logs and does parsing. So you can look up things through your, through your, your logging data. Um, just, if you, have, if you use this, you'll definitely wanna upgrade to this newest version immediately. As of last night, I believe it was the one I listed here on top. It's on a C, CVVS category, score, which is like an, an aggregate of different factors on severity. It is a 10 out of 10, so it's very severe. It's affecting a, almost every vendor in existence. Um, you'll want to follow your vendor guidelines. I know like Cisco, VMware, IBM, a lot of the major players have already patched this. So you want to follow their guidelines on that. And if you want to read more about specifics on it, uh, there's a very good blog for cybersecurity called hunters.com slash blog. It'll probably be right at the top to look at, but that, that uh, CVE dash number there, that is the article. So with that, I'll get right into the presentation. I'm not picking up the audio, Santo. Does um, anyone else have that? I can't hear him either. Okay. Sorry, one second. Sure. Perfect. 
Perfect. Um, while we work on that, I will give a few quick program updates I was going to give at the end uh, related to the chamber. So uh, we just want to remind everybody about the Shop Local CHQ program that we have, um, which is uh, uh, both the online platform, shoplocalchq.com, uh, which aggregates purchases through lots of our local businesses and vendors across the county into one purchase, then ship to your door, or the gift card program, which we are off and running, loading gift cards, uh, busy this time of year, but a great way for you, uh, whether gifting to other individuals or you know, as a company gift for employees to uh, keep those dollars local. And uh, we have uh, over 140 uh, local businesses across Chautauqua County of all types that accept those gift cards. Um, and they work as a consumer, just like a Visa gift card. So if you'd like to order those, we fulfill those right here at the chamber offices. And uh, we're always happy to, uh, you know, you can stop in to pick those up or we're happy to deliver them, um, you know, somewhat within reason. So um, feel free to give us a call or email anytime. And do you want to give it another shot? Yeah, yeah, sorry about that. Yep. All right, here we go. Hi, everyone. My name is Sano D'Amico. I'm the Operations Manager for Ultimate Tech Solutions here in Falconer. Today, we'll be covering a few topics relating to cybersecurity. Our hope is that you'll walk away with a better understanding of the threats businesses face and how to start thinking about mitigating those risks within your own company. Cybersecurity is a very large topic, so while we'll only be touching on a few ideas today, we'll be open for Q&A at the end of today's presentation. You can always reach out to our company to discuss any cybersecurity and other IT-related issues. Most often when we hear the term cybersecurity, we think about a shadowy figure in a dark room typing away, or Hugh Jackman dancing in front of way too many monitors and swordfish, right? Well, the first part could be true we tend to overlook someone completely obvious, ourselves, and by extension, our employees or, or even our customers. While all of us as individuals are not out to steal information, or at least we, we hope you aren't, you may inadvertently cause damage to hardware or software, and you may unknowingly help someone who is nefarious make their way into your company system. How we assess risk, implement solutions to mitigate that risk, and how we follow best practices makes up cybersecurity. So exactly is it and why is it important? Well, it protects all categories of data from theft and damage. This can include personally identifiable information, protected health information, intellectual property, data, and governmental and industry information systems as well. So here's the numbers. According to cybersecurityventures.com, in 2020, it was estimated that about a trillion dollars was lost to and spent repairing damages from cyber criminals and their attacks. By the end of this year, that estimate is expected to balloon to six trillion. This number inflated very quickly due to a flood of the global workforce working from home and IT professionals having to scramble to make the infrastructure secure and, and workable. This number is expected to increase about 15% year after year and shows no signs of slowing down. Now we all hear about some of the large enterprises being breached, Sony, SolarWinds, Colonia Pipeline, Twitch for example. Um, these kinds of breaches make the headlines, but what you don't hear about is small and medium sized businesses that are hacked or breached daily. In fact, over 50% of all hacks are these small and medium sized businesses. And it makes perfect sense, right? So many small businesses don't have those sort of resources or personnel or knowledge to mitigate those threats. It's also estimated that 60% of all small to mid sized businesses go out of business within six months of falling victim to a data breach or a hack. And the common denominator between these cyber attacks is people. And that's, and that's everyone in your organization. Oftentimes, it's even our C-suite executives. Why is that? Because they have a high level of access, therefore, they become targets. 85% of all incidents include a human element. And of that 85%, 35% were driven by social engineering as the primary factor in that hack. We'll discuss social engineering in an upcoming slide. I want to touch on some of the main threats today. Top five we kind of alluded to before is people. It's us. Um, cloud, you know, what is it? 
why is why is everyone moving to it and how do we secure that infrastructure uh, the big buzzword everyone's talking about right now is ransomware we're going to highlight that as well we also want to quickly touch on data privacy supply chain and mistaking compliance for protection and vice versa so let's talk about ourselves yes we are the problem but that's actually good news why because it means we're in control we have the power to secure our infrastructure to change our mindset so that we're more security focused to think before we plug in that usb drive we found on the ground in the parking lot and to take a deeper look at that email before we click the attachment we hold most of the cards when it comes to security according to the nist computer security resource center social engineering is defined as the act of deceiving an individual into revealing sensitive information obtaining unauthorized access or committing fraud by associating with the individual to gain their confidence and their trust the key word there is trust we're all human we want to trust people it's in our nature right now some examples of social engineering include phishing spear phishing malware and tailgating phishing is something most of us are familiar with it's a term that's been going around let's say John gets sent an email saying hey your PayPal account's been compromised click here to reset your password on first glance the email looks pretty legit I'm sure John scared now that he's been hacked clicks the link or the button but instead of that link directing him to PayPal's website it directed him to a fake site for him to input his credentials which will be stolen and sold and the act of clicking the reset button in that email led to the installation of malware onto his desktop without him even realizing it. Spear phishing is like phishing as it involves a bad actor posing as a legitimate company or individual. But in this case, it's a company or individual you interact with frequently who's been hacked without you knowing. This could be a vendor, a broker, or anyone who does business with your company. Remember when we talk quickly about data privacy supply chain? Well, that's how third parties handle their own security. Spear phishing can be a consequence of this issue. If a vendor sends you a monthly invoice and your account's payable rep is used to clicking that attachment to download the PDF file, they may not think twice when that file name or extension looks slightly different this time around, or they click a link to make a payment. If you fall victim to this type of attack, then your company could be used to compromise another company and so on and so forth those dominoes fall so how do you prevent against these type of phishing attacks well it honestly starts with being a little bit more vigilant it's okay to be slightly paranoid now we aren't talking like full-on history channel aliens paranoid right but in order to stop these attacks you do need to think before you click check that sender's email address so many times the address will be similar to a legitimate domain such as PayPal spelt with an I instead of a Y or someone copying and pasting pictures from the internet that looks like legitimate transaction history maybe on your Amazon account and of course having those solid security fundamentals in place such as a, a firewall and XDR solutions maybe on your endpoints that will help block the receipt of some of these emails and or break those connections and stop installation of malicious software Malware is often a consequence of social engineering attacks such as phishing. Now, malware is obviously a, a virus or a set of viruses um, that infect your computer. And you may be asking, why is it listed under people? Well, normally it's because of social engineering. Now, malware encompasses many types of viruses, Trojans, spyware, adware, rootkits, and of course, ransomware. We won't be discussing all the types of malware in this presentation, but there are many flavors of malware and having proper security procedures in place will help mitigate those types of attacks. Tailgating is another type of social engineering tactic. An example of this is someone's maybe dressed up as a delivery driver, bunch of boxes waiting to get into the building so they can follow or get waved in by the front desk. From there, that individual could compromise the network. They can plug into a, a port that's left open um, and take, take all the data, have full access. And that leads us into our next point. One important, sometimes overlooked security fundamental is physical. It's locking up your assets. Many times a company's IT infrastructure is in a central location, often in a temperature controlled room, right? Making sure these doors are locked, the network rack is locked, maybe you have key fob access or surveillance, you know, so you know exactly who's accessing your systems and when is very important. 
having ports shut down on your switch or router uh, that isn't being used. This also holds true for an individual on a computer or server. Is your computer password protected? Are you locking the PC before you get up from your desk to grab a cup of coffee? Uh, anyone in IT can tell you a story about how their colleagues messed with, messed with them when they left their computer open, such as inverting the mouse or display. When that happens, you'll remember the next time. But in all seriousness, it comes down to taking the problem seriously. It starts with securing your IT infrastructure and then training your employees and yourself on best practices. Next, we want to touch a little on the cloud. Simply put, the cloud is someone else's computer. Practically, it's the utilization of a large company's data center to run applications, store data, process workloads. There's different types of clouds, such as public and private clouds. A public cloud example could be your Gmail, while your private cloud could be your VMware environment at your Buffalo location. Regardless of how you have or want to have your cloud set up, we do know one thing. Cloud services are only increasing. In fact, according to the International Data Corporation, the cloud, the global cloud services market is projected to reach a trillion dollars by 2024. It's understandable that data and applications being off-site would bring up security concerns. The cloud is a wonderful tool and often means increasing long-term costs through monthly subscriptions, but reducing the need for expensive physical infrastructure in the short term and maintenance of said equipment right in the long term. That said, what vulnerability should we be concerned with? Misconfiguration is probably the biggest one. The cloud is not simple. Large companies like to market the cloud as easy to use and configure. Just spin up an instance in the cloud and have your favorite apps available, right? Sure, that's great if you don't really care too much about access control and security. The cloud is just as complicated, if not more complicated, to properly configure than on-premise infrastructure. And that means you need knowledgeable people to properly design, configure, and implement cloud solutions. And the larger the scale, the more automation can play a role in that. As more applications, data, and networking moves to the cloud, the less control and visibility IT professionals could have over their infrastructure. For small companies, this could be great, could be a blessing. The cloud may alleviate the burden of monitoring flows and maintaining infrastructure. For large companies that want more insight and control over their flows, the cloud could become burdensome to deploy those solutions in order to get some of that control and visibility back. Migration between clouds can lead to incomplete data deletion as well. Maintaining integrity and encryption when moving data between cloud services can become cumbersome and does require some diligence. And of course, the applications being deployed can also be a source of vulnerability. This is also true, of course, for on-premise infrastructure, but that could be a possible attack vector within the code uh, or of a certain app or how it's deployed into that infrastructure, etc. Let's talk a little bit about ransomware. We've all read companies impacted by it. It's the big buzzword now. Many have lost millions, lost their reputation because of it. And in many cases of small businesses, they've had to shut down because of it. So what is it? Ransomware is when a bad actor gets into your network, steals your data, often selling the data to the highest bidder, and then encrypts all of your data and ransoms it back to you, demanding you pay them a lot of money in order to get your data decrypted. Often you are asked to pay a second time so they won't leak the stolen info on the dark web. An important thing to remember here is that ransomware can live in your network for months or years before a ransom is ever triggered. Often that infection starts with something simple like malware on your computer from clicking a bad attachment or a link. From there that malware spreads through your network siphoning data and sending it back to cyber criminals. Sorry about that. Uh, so how can we combat it? Having a business continuity plan and disaster recovery strategies in place is the first thing to do. Having a backup of all your critical data is key. Of course, securing your network and training personnel and security best practices applies here as well. So what do you do if you're breached and your data is being held for ransom? Well, the first sign of a breach for with ransomware is usually someone will say like, hey, my Z drive is full of files with weird names. Some things are missing. It's a telltale sign that your data could be stolen or encrypted. First thing you need to do is 
lock down your, your system the best you can. If you don't know how, then contact an expert in cybersecurity or an IT consulting firm. Find patient zero, disconnect that endpoint from the network, identify the infection and verify your backups. This is the critical point where you either have really great backups or you're maybe considering in your head, do I need to pay, pay this ransom? Remember, you are dealing with criminals, so there's no guarantee that paying them will get your files decrypted. You should also consult your legal counsel here as more than likely you do have a legal requirement to report this breach to law enforcement. Uh, trying to hide that breach can lead to major consequences much, much worse than what it's going to take to recover from an attack. The big takeaway here is that prevention is key. Cybersecurity is all about assessing risk and mitigating those risks as best you can. Do you want to quickly touch here on um, supply chain risk management? Uh, most companies rely on other companies to provide or deliver product, handle data, etc. If you're a bank, you would expect that company picks up cash at the end of the day and is thoroughly vetted, right? You'd expect them to maybe have an armored vehicle, reliable couriers, etc. The same principles should apply to third parties that handle your data or your network traffic, your managed systems, your cloud solutions, right? Sometimes this can be a challenge, especially if that third party is out of state or international. They may have different compliance regulations to follow that are more lenient or stringent than your company's regulations. What it simply comes down to is having that conversation about our requirements to our vendors, and then holding them accountable and even auditing where applicable. Briefly, also want to touch on mistaken compliance or protection. It's a very common misconception. Compliance does not necessarily equal protection and vice versa. Compliance is, of course, a necessity in industry, but it often falls way short of actual protection. So what exactly can we do? Well, it starts with educating yourself and then your employees on security best practices. Start with the simple things and expand upon what you already do. Not writing down passwords, changing those passwords every 90 days or so, using two-factor authentication or MFA or multi-factor authentication where you can so you can authenticate with something you know like a password and something you have like an authenticator app or key fob. Do those basics first and then expand from there. Surround yourself with the right technology professionals, whether that's internally or through an IT consulting firm. Talk with an expert also on how to start implementing a zero trust policy model. The in-depth nature of zero trust is a little out of scope for this presentation, but its name kind of gives you a hint as to its nature and it is quickly becoming the standard. So overall, you know, this presentation and us in general aren't here to scare you. The internet does open endless possibilities to conduct business. But like anything else, it's susceptible to those that would try to exploit you and your customers. I want to quickly talk about a couple of rebuttals that we often hear. Uh, one of them, big one, for example, is, hey, we haven't really had any issues. Why should we invest in a cybersecurity? And more bluntly, why should we care and pay money to do something that we haven't had issues with, right? Or implementing these policies will slow down our productivity. It's going to make it more difficult to access those things that we need. These are great questions that we do want to address. Unfortunately, you really only kind of get one shot at getting this right. It may not happen today or tomorrow, but a breach is inevitable if you aren't protected. And once it happens, there's a high chance you don't recover from it at all. Data gets stolen, wrecks your reputation, combined with the cost to recover, and then go and implement the right security standards, that could wipe you out overnight. Now, the great thing about having properly implemented cybersecurity is it does increase your company's productivity and therefore your bottom line. I really like this quote by Dr. Uh, Romeo Farinacci, the TED talk that I watched some time ago. He says, cybersecurity is like brakes on a car. They aren't there to stop you. They're there to enable you to go faster, right? If you had a car that didn't have brakes on it, you probably A, wouldn't drive or B, you'd be going very slowly. Cybersecurity enables you to do your job without all that worry and stress. It allows you to have all types of workers, remote, hybrid, different types of devices, you know, mobile, laptops, uh, Amazon Alexas, or, or other types of IoT devices. No matter where they connect from, who's connecting on them, they're secure, they're safe, 
your company secure, your, your customer's data is safe, and you're able to go faster, and maybe most importantly here, helps you sleep better at night knowing that your company is protected. We want to thank you for listening today. Quick plug, we do offer free cybersecurity and network assessments, so if you're interested in that, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Also, a quick note here on the Q&A section, for the sake of time, we are going to try to keep technical jargon to a minimum and speak to more of cybersecurity as a whole. If you have any specific use case or, or corner case questions for your business, please contact us afterwards. There's a, a list there through email, phone, website, however you want to do that, go ahead. Um, and we'll discuss those scenarios at length with you. We now turn it over to the great men and women at the Jamestown Police Department, and we thank them for always putting themselves in harm's way every day and every night to keep us safe. Thank you so much, everyone. Great. Thank you, Santo. Um, thank you. Great presentation. A lot of information there. As I mentioned before, if uh, something jumped out at you or you have a question you want to ask, please send it in the chat. We will turn it over to Officer Reinhardt uh, before we do Q&A to talk about um, some uh, other types of business security, more traditional, as well as uh, some new initiatives you have going on at the police department. Thanks. So for anyone that doesn't know, my name is Matt Reinhardt. I work for the Jamestown Police Department. And currently I'm assigned as the community resource officer. Um, I still work patrol when I'm needed, but my primary focus is dealing with the community and different partnerships that we are going through right now. I also handle our accreditation and some different stuff from the governor's reform plan. Today, as Dan mentioned, um, I'm here to talk about some basic business safety um, and specifically that will address different, what some people consider minor issues that they're having with businesses generally in a downtown, in a city sort of setting. So to start off, um, I'm gonna go with, if you're going to work in the morning, the number one thing you wanna do is park your vehicle somewhere that's safe. Um, if you work during the day and when you return to your vehicle at night, it's gonna be dark out, it's best to try to find somewhere that will be lit if you have to walk from your place of business to where your car is parked. When you get out of your car in the morning, the number one thing, number three things that you wanna do is make sure all your windows are rolled up, your sunroof is closed and all of your doors are locked. You also don't wanna leave any valuables in your car, especially if they're on the seat or somewhere that they can be seen. Uh, most people will steal things from vehicles when they're unlocked. Um, it's a basic principle of opportunity to commit a crime. But if you have a new MacBook or some sort of tech or any sort of, inf um, property that's expensive, valuable, that they can see through the window, that's when you're gonna get the outlier of somebody that's willing to break a window out, try to pop the door open to steal that property. If you walk far from where you park your car to where you get to work, it's not a bad idea if you can park with different coworkers and walk together as a group. That's beneficial for both the morning and for the evening. Again, when it's dark out, late at night if you work that type, sort of time frame. So now when you're at work and you're working and the day comes to an end where you're going to leave the business, and this is specifically more so for people that are closing the business um, versus someone that's just leaving for the day. At the close of business, you want to make sure that your doors and windows are locked and double check because sometimes people are in a rush and they forget. If you have interior and or exterior security lights, make sure they're on, make sure the light bulbs are working and that they're all good to go. Also, if you have interior and or exterior security cameras, you want to do the same as well. Make sure they're, if they're not power over ethernet or anything like that, that they're hardwired in, make sure their batteries are charged, make sure their settings are proper so that they are recording um, if something were to happen. Also, if you have an alarm system, make sure it's set. Um, and piggybacking off of the alarms, you want to make sure that your alarm company, whoever it is, whether it's local or, or not, um, that they have the current emergency and non-emergency contact information for whoever it would be needed to respond in the event that the alarm is triggered. So going into a little bit more detail um, on emergency and non-emergency information, one of the big things that we as the police department need is to have people's 
business information and emergency contact information accessible and on file. If your business is downtown or not downtown and there's a burglary or something where somebody enters your business during the overnight hours, we need the phone number to whoever is going to answer at two or three in the morning when somebody's entered it, has gone through, has stolen stuff, something along those lines. We can't call the daytime regular business hour phone number and likely get somebody to respond to the business if it's needed. Um, that could obviously be the owner, the manager, somebody that you trust. There could be a couple different people, just like on many alarm systems um, that can be called in order. Another thing to be aware of is that often if you have an iPhone, more specifically, that if you get a call from no caller ID, it could be the police department or one of the dispatchers from the county. So it's also important to make sure we have your non-emergency contact information, which is part of what this big um, group is doing. Um, although it's often sometimes the same as the emergency contact information, it doesn't necessarily have to be. With the different stuff that I'm doing, if we have a concern or looking to push out general information to you, we want to know who we need to talk to. Um, that, again, could be the manager or the owner of the business, maybe not necessarily the manager or the owner of the building. Um, if you trust that the people that we would talk to at the front desk or the front counter are going to get the information to you directly as the manager or the owner, then that's okay. Um, you just want to make sure that you have confidence that that information will be passed along to you if it's needed, because we would hate for somebody to miss out on an opportunity simply because they weren't aware of it. Furthermore, if you have non-emergency incidents or something that you or your staff thinks is minor and perhaps that the police won't be able to do anything, um, we still urge everybody to call and speak with an officer um, at the very least. If it's something where it's very, you know, it happened over the weekend, something went on and something is brought to your attention, I will give you all my contact information and you can just contact me versus um, speaking with somebody from patrol. Oftentimes we can document it in our system or develop crime trends with different things that happen, but if we're never told about them, then we have no idea that they ever took place. Um, also, if something seems similar, seems minimal to you, um, it could be possible that if you're in the downtown area or you're in a plaza, that something may have happened at your business that might have also happened at somebody else's. And if we know who uh, committed the crime or did whatever they did next door, it's likely that it was the same person um, at your property. And say, if you don't have cameras, but then the neighboring businesses do, then perhaps they can be charged or looked into for whatever the incident was. So that's kind of more like the basic stuff um, for the managers and owners or anybody that has a little more authority. Um, we're also working with another group to start implementing what is called SEPTED. It's crime prevention through environmental design. Um, they're just different principles that have to do with um, natural surveillance and trying to prevent crime by not necessarily building your business out of concrete block, um, but more windows and better lighting cameras so that people can see what's going on and that people are less likely to commit crimes. Um, if you would like somebody to come out to your business or your property to have them do um, an assessment of your business or your storefront, um, again, I'll give you my information and there's members of the sheriff's office that can come out if you're outside of the city to be able to help you with that as well. So a lot of this that I've talked about is about updating your information. So as a part of our group, we have developed a Google form that you can fill out. It's super basic. It'll give us the basic information that we need, the non-emergency and the emergency to have access to in the event that we need it. Um, this will work for both the police, the fire, and if you need an ambulance as well. So I'll just run over it real quick. Um, it's again, very basic. It includes your email, the business name, the business address, the business owner's name, the non-emergency phone number, the owner of the building, because sometimes that's different if there's more than one business in it, 
an emergency contact name, an emergency contact phone number, a secondary number, and then there's a spot to put in any other information that you want us to know about. As part of the non-emergency version of all of this, um, we as a partnership want to be able to call you, email you, and disseminate information to you on different events and street closings that are happening, especially in the downtown area. Um, this is the first year that we've done Coffee with a Cop that we did down at Tim Hortons in Brooklyn Square. Um, we've explored the idea of doing that at other coffee places, um, and we need information to be able to reach out to people and to know if they have any interest. Likewise, if other places are holding events and want law enforcement to be there, either in an official um, standard law enforcement role, or you just want somebody to walk through, say hello, uh, visit with whatever event you have going on, we also do that. Um, and you can get a hold of me if you have something planned. And part of the chamber is we're trying to get more events for us to attend. So we have tried to revitalize our neighborhood watch group in the city and the traditional version of it hasn't had a whole lot of feedback. So we have since joined with Neighbors by Ring, which is partnered with the Amazon. Um, it's simply an app that is available on your phone or you can just sign in on the computer. It's basically a social media platform that is designed to broadcast or show off um, different crimes that happen in different neighborhoods. Um, if anybody isn't aware, we've, we had a, a female that was stealing a bunch of stuff from cars um, on the south side of the city a couple months back. Um, and they were getting posted on there of her going through yards, um, her going into vehicles, stuff like that. So with us being partnered with them, we get email alerts as soon as anybody signs, anybody posts something from their camera or just as a text post. You don't have to have any cameras to have the app, read the app, or post anything. Right now, the big thing that we're seeing with it is packages that are stolen. Um, with the holiday season coming around, people are stealing packages all the time. The video doorbells that a lot of people have generally capture them. And if the person's face isn't completely covered, generally we can identify who it is. We had, again, another one that was posted within probably a week or two ago, we got the email, we had the person call us for it, and we knew who it was within a few minutes. Um, another example of this was we had some issues downtown at a particular business where the owner kept having his garbage cans entered, people were dumping them out, people were putting things into them, um, and you couldn't get it to stop, couldn't figure out who it was or really why they were doing it. He since put up a camera, has captured a couple different events on there that have been posted. Um, we've been able to identify every single person in the video that has shown up and caused problems. Um, and that's been a huge asset for us. Additionally, we have the ability to post different alerts for safety or requests for assistance. If you have push notifications enabled on your phone, you can get them sent right to you. And we don't post a lot of stuff on there that's not urgent. So if you get an alert from us on that application, it's generally something either regarding safety or we need somebody's help with something. In a situation where a package is stolen or multiple packages are stolen, we have the ability to send out an alert geographically to an area and request assistance is what it's called. If we're looking for an individual that may have stolen a package or committed any other sort of crime, we can push that uh, request for assistance out and you'll get an alert. If you have the video of it or have video of it from a different system, you can um, select the option to assist the police and you can provide whatever video you have or you can just call us and tell us if you have something that would be worth reviewing that may help one of your neighbors or um, a partnering business out. So again, you don't need to have cameras to set up the account, you can do it, it's free. And it's based on your geographical location. So if you own a business in the city, but you don't live in the city, and even if you do live in the city, you may wanna create a business account that focuses on where your business is because a lot of the alerts that you get are geographical and 
if you live somewhere separate, then you won't get the alerts relevant to the business. Furthermore, our social media, we have Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter that we use to push out different information. Some of it's safety-based, some of it's event-based, and Facebook would be our number one for information. Again, it's sometimes things that are not necessarily emergencies. We post missing people, uh, missing children, and just general updates. Our most wanted goes on there and our crime statistics as well. Um, if you're looking to see more information about us, that's definitely the place to go um, versus the neighbors, which is much more of an emergency-based platform. That's all I have. If you have any questions, I believe Dan's going to get back on now and we'll address all of them as they come in. Great. Thank you, Matt. Um, I did want to ask, is that Google form live um, where folks can submit their info? Yes, I believe we're finalizing the review of it tomorrow and then okay. it will be good to go. Okay, great. So everyone just watch, you know, we'll help send that out as well as the city and uh, police department. Um, for you to be able to submit your information. And I believe we had mentioned as well, you know, this is coming to the Jamestown Police Department. So if you're located outside of the city of Jamestown, you can always update your um, emergency contact information with the Sheriff's Office dispatch. Is that right? Yeah, they can still fill out the form. Um, our dispatch is done through the Sheriff's Department. So this will all get forwarded to them for the update. Okay, great. So uh, yeah, something always good to think about because people may have, you know, a landlord's contact, but not the actual tenants and businesses. Um, great. Well, thank you. Uh, and uh, if anyone has any questions, you're welcome to jump in. I do have a couple questions myself. Um, uh, and uh, I would ask uh, Santo, and I wanted to recognize as well, Utech Solutions is uh, Chris from Ultimate Tech as well as on. Um, I just wanted to know, you talked about, you know, people are a target through, uh, I guess I'm going to use spoof as, as lack of a better word. Uh, but I know, you know, shortly after joining the chamber here, uh, we had some of our team, you know, come to me and say, what was with that weird email you sent? And it was like, you know, Holly, do this immediately, please, as soon as possible. And, you know, I kind of had a feeling, okay, let me see what that looks like. And it was, you know, they had changed so that it showed the name of the account as Daniel Heitzen writer, but then it was just some wacky email. You know, what is, I guess, what type of a, an attack is that? And what's your advice? I guess, is it just vigilance? A lot of that comes down to vigilance. Absolutely. Um, that would be a type of phishing attack or social engineering attack. Basically, it's to get someone to say, hey, this looks legitimate. But the, and as long as they don't look further, then they're probably going to click on something. But as you said, um, you know, your folks were vigilant enough to take a look at the, the domain is at whatever, not being, you know, the Chautauqua chamber and, and got around that. So it's awesome. Sure. Great. OK, thanks. Um, yeah, and I know, um, Officer Reinhardt, one thing I had written down as well uh, was the uh, neighbors, because we had talked about this previ previously as well. So I just wanted to maybe highlight again, uh, which you already explained, that if you have a, you know, maybe live outside of the city, but your business is in the city, or like you said, you live in a sort of different area of town than your business is located, um, it's important to create a um, separate neighbor's account if you want to you know get those notifications because you as the police department can drill down really by blocks and send notifications right Correct. yep so if you can set the parameters um i forget what the exact number is it's like five to ten miles i believe um so if you live in the city you are probably okay as far as your business goes but you wouldn't get if there was a crime at the business next to your business and we send out the request for assistance um, that's really going to be limited to those few blocks. And if you have it registered with your residence or a different business that you own, that's outside of that, then you wouldn't get it and you wouldn't be able to see that. It's again, it's meant to be specific so that it's not a nuisance to people um, where you don't have all sorts of notifications coming in all day. It's really geared to if you get something from this, it's 
probably something that you should read. Great. Uh, we do, I don't, not as much of a question, but a compliment in the chat from Dallas. Uh, whoever is now in charge of posting on the Jamestown Police Department Facebook page gets five stars. The posts are lighthearted and humorous and create more engagement. So kudos to uh, uh, the department and uh, whoever's doing social media now. Um, I'll be sure, I'll be sure to let them know. Great. Um, so uh, we, I guess just any, any closing thoughts, either from, you know, Santo and ultimate tech or, um, you know, officer Reinhardt with the police department, anything, you know, as we've talked that you have to add or wanted to touch on. No, I'm going to just, um, send out my email and my cell phone number. If anybody has questions for me or has any direct reason to reach out to me directly i will send this to everybody now sure great and santo if you want to do the same you could drop um i know you had it in the presentation but um you could drop your contact info in the chat so folks can um you know easily grab that and i did want to as well um <clears throat> at the beginning i should have given you an opportunity santo to kind of just tell us a little bit about ultimate tech solutions i know you mentioned at the end of the presentation that you offer, you know, cybersecurity, um, you know, screenings and things, but uh, for folks who might not know, what is, uh, what is Ultimate Tech Solutions? Sure. Um, it's kind of all-encompassing IT. We're a managed service provider. Um, one thing I, I do want to touch on quick is we, we do offer surveillance as well and door access. So on the, on the physical side, the officer Reinhardt was talking about, we, we can help in that regard also. Great. All right. Well, thanks everybody uh, for joining and a last call for questions if anyone has any. Um, but I did want to hit my other reminder um, as far as chamber news, uh, just a quick save the date, especially for those folks here in Jamestown that we are working on Doors Open Jamestown, which will happen again this winter, uh, tentatively set for Saturday, January 22nd. And if you're not familiar, that's a day where Many of the local attractions around town, the museums and things are um, offer free admission. And uh, it's really a great opportunity to come out and see what is here in our community and then go out and uh, certainly have, you know, lunch and uh, local shopping, make a day of it to support local. So um, I want to, again, thank our panelists, uh, Santo uh, from Ultimate Tech Solutions and Officer Reinhardt from the Jamestown Police Department. We really appreciate all your time uh, you know, working with us to plan this and uh, being on this morning to talk to folks. And uh, obviously, you know, security is as uh, important as it all as always, especially for our businesses. And uh, hopefully you learned something. Like I said, we will keep this um, recorded as well uh, that we will share once we have an opportunity to uh, kind of edit the, the video down and we'll send it out. So thanks everybody for joining and I hope you have a great rest of your week.